Right, thank you very much everyone for joining us for the third keynote of this conference. Uh, so it's Klaus Keindl, and he's going to be talking about the lives of the infamous, reflections on autobiographical or biographical uh, turn in translation studies. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Klaus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I'll try to talk uh, clearly and loud. Um, first, I wanted to thank our organizers, James and Ethna, especially, but all the organizing team. You did a marvelous job and I admire you, especially when you have to deal with persons like me. I'm a technological illiterate. So thank you very much for all the work you put into the conference. Okay. Um, the person of the translator came into the focus of public debate earlier this year in the wake of the controversy over the translation of Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, which she read at the inauguration of the 47th president of the United States, Joe Biden. In the reviews of the translations, one point in particular caught my eye. There was criticism, at least in the case of the German translation, of the fact that the translators apparently did not draw from their own biographies in their work and instead incorporated their attitudes towards racism and diversity in the translation. One reviewer declared, okay, I'll try to do that like this. And here you have the quote, the profession of a literary translator is characterized by the ability to translate work in a way that is appropriate to the text material, independent of one's own biography and with knowledge and tradition of register. In fact, the reviewer is saying nothing other than Antoine Berman, who in his book, Pour une critique des traductions, also dealt with the person of the literary translator a good, years, a good 25 years earlier. According to Berman, biographical information and psychological aspects are of interest only in the case of authors. In the case of translators, only details such as nationality, professions, languages and translated works, as well as any theoretical writings are of relevance. The only exceptions are famous translators, according to Berman where other aspects of their biography are also relevant and interesting. Autobiographies would thus be exclusively reserved to for so-called great men, an androcentric view which is rooted in the origins of the genre and which has now uh, not only been called into question but is also long outdated. In line with Jacques Derrida's essay, what is a relevant translation? One could therefore ask, what is a relevant translator? Is it translators who translate great works? Or is it their reflections on translation that generate resonance? Is it translators who sacrifice their lives, like the Japanese translator of Salman Rushdie, Itoshi Igarashi, or his Italian translator, Ettore Capriolo? who fell victim to the fatwa of the Ayatollah Khomeini. If you search Google for famous translators, the results contain very different listings. Some include only male translators, other consciously include women. Some mention only historical translators, other list living translators. The selection criteria are highly diverse, not to say arbitrary. In his essay, The Life of Infamous Men, which also served as a, title, a quote in my title for this, this talk, uh, Michel Foucault made an impressive case for the fact that not only great men are worthy of biography. According to him, historical greatness is not a determining factor, but the writing of a bi biography in itself is sufficient to make a person worthy of biography. So the question should not be about the importance of a translator, but about what meaning a translator gives to his or her life. To me, this seems to be the proper starting point of translatorial autobiographical research. Accordingly, I will assume that 
every lit literary translator is of significance and that it is the task of literary translation studies to identify their relevance and to learn from it. In this talk, I would like to elaborate on how this can be researched and what benefit knowledge about the lives of literary translators can have for us. In doing so, I would like to focus on two aspects in particular. First, the question of what the writing of a translator's biography can look like. And second, how life writing texts of translators can be made useful for our discipline. In this context, I would like to outline methodological as well as conceptual and analytical approaches. So let's turn to biography in translation studies. And I would like to start with a quote, namely, biography is academic suicide. These are the words of the famous biographer and literary scholar, Deirdre Baer, who recently passed away, uh, not because of her of the biography she wrote, by the way. Uh, following Foucault's declaration of the death of the subject and Barth's dictum of the death of the author, it would indeed be problematic to view the object of a scholarly biography in terms of an autonomous and transcendental subject or to reduce the work to autobiographical facts. Rather, modern biographical research focuses on constructing or deconstructing identities and on seeing the subject as a performative materialization of cultural, social and psychological influences, which in turn have various effects on actions, works and in our case, translations. A translator centered approach to biography is still largely in its in its infancy. And it seems that it has not yet moved beyond the question of what is and is not relevant about a translator's life. The few existing efforts concentrate on an account of the translatorial or professional identity and the aspects seen as related to it, such as language acquisition, entry into the prof trans translation profession and the representation of their translations. In most of these studies, life is seen as a journey to a particular destination in which the subject passes through different stages, or as Pierre Bourdieu put it, and I quote, like a coherent recital of a meaningful sequence of events. The approaches to a translator's biography that I am familiar with thus fall into what Pierre Bourdieu calls the biographical illusion. By this, he means the attempt to capture a life as a mere sequence of events, which is similarly absurd, and I quote, as to try and account for a trip in the metro without taking into consideration the structure of the network, that is to say the matrix of objective relations between the various stations. For the question of translatorial identity in the sense of professional identity, this means that it cannot be viewed in isolation from the many other aspects of a person's identity, nor from the cultural, historical, and social context in which a person lives. Thus, the scope of a translator's identity must be much broader than it is the case in previous biographical studies. I would like to demonstrate this with the example of Scott Moncrief, the first translator of Marcel Proust's A la recherche du temps perdu into English. But first, a brief word about uh, on the thorny concept of identity, which is rarely grounded in theory. In translation studies, identity is mostly associated with a life between, with, in two languages, and the related in-betweenness leading to bi, inter, multicultural, or hybrid identity constructs. However, each person has a variety of nested identities. They influence each other and are, form, and, are formed, and are formed based on group affiliations. This means that the professional identity constitutes only one part of a translator's identity. 
Identity is a multi-layered construct with cracks and contradictions, an arena of different identifications in competition, complementarity, and agreement with each other. In other words, professional identity intersects with other categories of identity, such as gender, sexuality, ethnicity, language, culture, social class, religion, age, and so on. The identity of the translator is therefore the result of all the experiences a translator gains from his or her various roles. At the same time, these experiences also serve to define oneself in relation to others, both in terms of sameness and distinctiveness. The task of a translator-centered biography is to illuminate how the nested identities interrelate and thus lead to the formation of a translatorial identity. Charles Kenneth Scott Moncrieff had a variety of identities, which played a role in his decision to become a translator and that also influenced his approach to translation. He was an Englishman, an author, a homosexual, a soldier, a Catholic, a spy. All these aspects are described in Jean Findlay's wonderful biography, which is well worth reading. I would like to shed some light on the role his identities, which must be understood not as the result of a passively experienced socialization, but rather as a process of appropriation, played in his decision to become a translator. In order to capture this process, I would like to relate his biography to the two concepts of transition and turning point. These are used in a variety of disciplines, but for our purposes, narrative identity studies and social history seem to me to be the most relevant. Since becoming a translator is often not the first goal in life, and decisions are made at very different times and in different phases, these two concepts are particularly suitable for retracing a person's winding path to translation. In every life, there are certain transitions that take place at a certain point in time and that have a certain normative character. The timing, that is, when a transition is socially customary is culture specific. Transitions can take place in all areas of life. Examples would be starting school, completing an education, moving house, military service, marriage, the birth of a child, and so on. Turning points also represent events which influence the further course of life, both positively and negatively. The main difference between transitions and turning points is the timing. While transitions conform to socially constructed timetables, turning points are unforeseen or unplanned events, such as fleeing, emigration, or to name a positive event, winning the lottery. Therefore, the main characteristics of turning points are that they do not take place at socially normalized times and trigger an alteration of life path or a course correction. Whether an event is perceived as a turning point depends on a historical and cultural context, as well as on numerous biographical factors. What was expected of the individual, for example, with regard to their professional career? What cultural and social capital was involved? Which personality traits does the individual inhibit, exhibit? Scott Moncrieff's trajectory takes place in a phase in which several life-changing circumstances converged that ultimately led him to abandon his real goal of establishing himself as an author and to identify himself primarily with the role of a translator. Born in 1889, he grew up in a middle-class home and, thanks to a scholarship, attended Winchester College from 1903. Only a year later, at the age of 15, he published his first poems in magazines and in 1907, he founded a literary magazine with some friends. From the beginning, he had ambitions to become a poet, 
Interestingly, he used a number of pseudonyms in addition to his own name. Jean Findlay, his biographer, believes this is to be evidence of his difficulty with his identity, the main issue being his sexual orientation. Scott Moncrief was homosexual and the number of his poems, especially early ones, had a clear homoerotic underpinning. At a time when homosexuality was not only socially frowned upon, but also punishable. He fought in France in the First World War with his superiors and his subordinates describing him as particularly brave, comradely and loyal. And he himself also greatly enjoyed serving as a soldier, which is evidenced by a series of letters he wrote to family and friends. Moreover, contemporaries describe his appearance as very masculine in the heteronormative sense. In 1917, Scott Moncrief suffered a leg injury by friendly fire in the trenches at Monchy in France, resulting in long periods of rehabilitation. surgery and ultimately a, life, a lifelong disability. During his convalescence, Scott Moncrief began to engage more intensively with translation, initially as a critic. In 1918, then already an invalid, he met and fell in love with the aspiring poet Wilfred Owen. The love was probably one-sided, but Scott Moncrief recognized in him a poetic talent he himself would never have, as he also notes in a letter to fellow translator Edward Marsh, and I quote, I don't write good poetry, and fortunately I know it, end of quote. <clears throat> a series of unfortunate circumstances also caused his family to fall into financial hardship at this time, and Scott Moncrief felt obliged, as befitted his understanding of loyalty and decency, to support them, which he would not have been able to do on his literary income alone. His war wound, which was permanent and which ultimately probably also shook his idea of masculinity, his encounter with the poet Wilfred Owen, which made him doubt his own abilities as a poet, and the financial crisis of his families were the, were the decisive turning points that led him to turn to translation from 1918. His aspirations for an identity as an author, his identity as a soldier, and above all his gender and sexual identity played an important role in the development of his translatorial identity. His first translation, La Chanson de Roland, was preceded by three poems of his own, which he dedicated to dead friends, one of them Wilfred Owen. He thus presented himself to the readership as an author before he presented his translation. The choice of texts, in addition to the Chanson de Roland, he also translated Beowulf at this time, again with his own poems preceding it, probably had to do with his soldierly understanding of honor, bravery, and loyalty. Most importantly, however, it seems to me that little attention has been paid in his biography to the connection between his sexual and translatorial identity. I would like to point out a few aspects that in my opinion give indications of a connection between these two identities in Scott Moncrief. For this purpose, I would like to apply Mary Galvin's hypothesis of queer poetics to translation. Mary Galvin states, and I quote, in a culture structured significantly by heterosexism and whiteness, the mind that can imagine other sexualities and gender-raised identities must also imagine other ways of speaking, new forms to articulate our visions of difference, end of quote. Accordingly, one could also say that living and translating within a heteronormative world that classified homosexual identities as perverted required translation strategies within the accepted patriarchal division of original and translation. 
Moncrief's appearance and his affinity for heteronormative masculine virtues, such as bravery, honor, and loyalty, were in contrast to the widespread stereotyped image of an effeminate and cowardly homosexual. In translation, he also undermined general beliefs in the hierarchy between translator and author by manipulating the divisions between writing and translating and by translating alongside accepted translation narratives. Similar to how his sexual identity oscillated between visible and invisible, between accepted and unaccepted behavior, his translations also oscillated between visibility and invisibility, between following and undermining the hierarchy of original and translation. This becomes evident in the mixed reviews of his translations, which on the one hand emphasize faithfulness and exact replication, but on the other repeatedly criticize liberties and deviations. It is also reflected in his translator's dedications, which consist of his own poems. And it is also revealed in his own reviews of translations, in which he postulated his personal aesthetics, which went beyond the common dichotomy of fluent and faithful renderings, and saw translation as a vocation and a service to literature. What I wanted to illustrate with these biographical remarks is that mapping a translator's life means not to compartmentalize, but to embrace life's complexity with its contradictions, frictions, pitfalls, and to include the intersecting identity constructions of a translator. The translator's identity consists of many nested identities that cannot be separated from each other or neglected in biographical research. So let us now turn to life writing texts, to our autobiographies and their role in translation studies. Not only biographical research, but also the analysis of autobiographical texts of translators or life writing texts as they are called in the relevant literature is still a largely neglected source for translator centered research. The philosopher Wilhelm Dilthey, who is considered the founder of human studies, Geisteswissenschaften, saw autobiography as central to understanding history or human culture. One reason for the lack of interest in translators' autobiographies may be that, as mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, a translator's life is not expected to be relevant to their work. The translator's ego as a relevant dimension, their life as the object and focus of a text contradicts the conventional role assigned to translators, which is not to place themselves or their own lives and translation works in the spotlight, but rather the author. I'm convinced that autobiographical texts can be used to explore uncharted territories of translation by answering questions such as, what does translation do to a life? And what does life do to translation? Which paths lead to translation and which lead away from it? And thus, above all, the question of how translators see themselves. Such self-testimonies also reveal an aspect that is often downplayed in translation studies, namely the fact of subjectivity, or to put it in another way, the uniqueness of each translator. While this is precisely what authors are credited with, translators are not supposed to have their own personality ultimately in order to maintain the illusion that translators have no influence on the text, rendering it faithfully and unchanged. An, autobiog an autobiography runs counter to this idea because it is first and foremost a statement, namely, I as a translator am someone with a story worth to be told. Life writing can take a variety of forms. Autobiographies in the narrower sense, but also memoirs, journals, diaries, letters, self-portraits, autofictional texts, and so on. New technologies have also given rise to web-based forms of autobiography, such as blogs, 
personal websites, online diaries or social media profiles, and even digital biography services offering identity management for a fee. While the various types of life writing texts have different forms and purposes, they have one thing in common, they reveal the self of the translator. Which brings me to the second central concept besides that of identity, the self. Sometimes identity is seen as part of the self, and sometimes they are seen as closely interconnected dimensions. Oysermann describes the self as a repository of autobiographical memories. It is the result of mental, emotional, and reflective processes, which lead to the self-attribution of certain characteristics, which cannot necessarily be assigned to a specific identity or identity category. The resulting beliefs are expressed in a person's self-concept, which includes introspection, self-perception, perception of others' reaction to oneself, and social comparison. Based on the experiences we gain through this lens, we construct self-schema for certain areas of life. A translatorial self-schema would therefore be an awareness regarding one's own beliefs, attitudes and values associated with translation. Often, it is the feeling of a split self that is expressed as in-betweenness in autobiographical texts. This in-betweenness can be found on different levels and sometimes even features in the title of autobiographical texts. And here you have three examples. The translator Dennis Johnson Davis sees his life between the lines in his memoirs. The translator Svetlana Gaia titled her memoirs A Life Between the Languages. The title of the autobiography of the Russian translator Elizabeth Markstein refers to a life between two worlds. In turn, some transla translators reveal little about themselves, and if they do so, they then only in a roundabout way. A good example of this is, is the diaries of the Russian translator Friedrich Fiedler. In his diaries, he, as a person, is almost completely absent. His meticulous entries revolve exclusively around his contacts and conversations with authors and other translators. The diaries do contain some information about his own translations, but only in the words of authors who spoke to him about his translations or wrote to him about them. This virtual absence of an eye in an autobiographical text is remarkable, and it would be interesting to investigate how common this erasure of the eye from autobiographical texts is among translators. And this brings me to my last question, that is a question of a systematic approach for researching autobiographical texts, some of which also applies to the writing of translator biographies, but for reasons of time, I will concentrate on life writing texts. The five steps are not clearly separated from each other, often take place parallel to each other, and sometimes in a different order. Step one, research. Life writing texts are cultural artifacts and thus can only be analyzed in their historical context. In order to be able to assess the social positioning of the protagonists in the text, the formulated theoretical assumptions and any translation poetics, it is first necessary to research how translation and translators are viewed in cultural, social, political, ideological terms at the, term, at the time when the autobiographical texts were, were written. Step two, classify. Often the title already indicates whether it is a memoir, diaries, confessions, or an autobiography in the narrower sense. Depending on the genre, the text serves different functions. The classification also includes formal aspects, such as, is there a preface or an afterword by another person? Are there notes? Is there an index? Are photos included in the text? What function do they fulfill? 
What are the memories based on, on private, personal, or verifiable experiences? Another essential question regards the target audience. Is such an audience explicitly addressed? Is there a dedication, a prefixed motto? Step three is specify. The point of this step is to specify what is interesting about the text. The first question is, at what point in time is the translator writing their story? The life narrated is the interpretation of past events, situations, encounters. Memories change over time. So it is also important to specify at what stage of life an autobiographical text was written. Questions about omissions, gaps in the narrative are also relevant, and it should be clarified why this was done. In this context, I would like to mention the memoirs of Gerhard Heller. They are an intriguing example. During the Second World War, he was a Nazi cultural functionary in occupied Paris and worked as a censor. After the war, he remained in France and from the 1960s onwards, made a career as a translator of Céline and Julian Green, among others. His memoirs, Un Allemand à Paris, a German in French, published in French in 1981, focus only on the years 1940 to 1944 and serve primarily to portray him as an admirer and even protector of French literature. Although translation is not discussed in his memoirs, it is clear that against the background, that the, against the background of the critical debate in France about the Nazi occupation that was burgeoning in the 1970s, Heller wanted to use his autobiographical text to sketch out a coherent life path in which his activity as a Nazi functionary was in harmony with his later activity as a translator. As a translator, he saw himself, as can be seen from his letters and to authors and publishers, as a mediator driven by love and affinity for French literature. What these memoirs also demonstrate is the need to specify the extent to which the activity and the person are situated in a larger political and social context. Moreover, the significance of translation in the narrative as well as the content of the text should be clarified. For example, is it about the procurement of translation assignments, work processes, working conditions, difficulties in translating, contact, personal relationships, collaborations, competitions with publishers, authors, other translators, and so on. Step four is select. Once the material has been sifted through and specified, those aspects or questions that are suitable for closer examination can be selected. Depending on the material, there are a number of possibilities, of which I will only give a few examples. For example, which self-concept, which self-understanding, and which self-awareness is expressed in the life writing texts? How does a translator justify that their story is worth telling? What is their relationship to their languages? Are they working tools, political instruments, or something completely different? How is the relationship to authors described? To what extent do they claim authority for themselves? What does the text say about how the translator sees their role? What role do gender, sexuality, ethnicity, body and embodiment, social class and status play in identity construction and what influence do they have on professional identity formation? How is the translational experience presented as a vocation, as a learning process, as something that has grown? What role do institutions uh, what role do intuition, training, and experience play in building or acquiring translatorial competence? Depending on which aspects are deemed worthy of investigation, analytical instruments and concepts are chosen in the final step that is analyze. Translator studies, but also autobiography studies, offer a wide range of analytical approaches. 
Precisely because the forms and aims of life writing are very diverse, it is also important to have a mutable set of methods and concepts to approach translators' autobiographies. In autobiography studies, a narrative approach via the analysis of plotting is often cited as a method in addition to close reading. Thus, the narrative follows certain patterns, such as those of the Bildungsroman, or is it rather a kind of personal story of self-discovery? What narrative devices are used to construct an identity? In the book, Literary Translator Studies, which I edited with Waltraud Kolb and Daniela Schlager, I gave an overview of a, of a number of concepts that can also be used for the analysis of life writing texts. In addition to turning points and transitions, as well as the theoretically grounded concepts of identity and self mentioned in this talk, I would like to name concepts such as agency, role, voice, and telos, which can be helpful for the systematic analysis of life writing texts, depending on the research question and the aim of the research. So let me jump to the, my conclusions. Dirk de la Bastita once critically remarked that the many turns in translation studies can make one dizzy. I hope that I have not caused any dizziness with my title, Reflections on an Autobiographical Turn in Translation Studies. I understand turn quite simply as a fundamental shift, one that focuses not so much on the text, but on the person, not so much on the translation, but on the translator, without displacing a text-based perspective. An autobiographical turn is thus not in competition but in a complementary relationship to the other social, cultural, cognitive turns, to name just some, some of them. The aim is not to find a, a universal translatorial self, but to show the points of interconnectivity between the multiformity of translation and the diverse individual identities and selves beyond national, social, ethnic, and gender borders. The lives of literary translators and their products, literary translations, are no discrete entities. They are entangled in many ways. The autobiographical turn aims at building a dialogue between these two, whereby it is not a matter of equating work and person, but of showing that literary translation studies must not focus solely on translation as an abstraction or on social structures in which translation takes place, but must also investigate the lives of individuals, how they practice translation, how they move within social structures, and how they follow change or undermine norms and conventions. This can both test the validity of the grand narratives of translation and overcome the great misconception that literary translators are only marginal figures in, in literature. In order to understand the history of literary translation, in order to understand literary translation itself, one must also understand the life of the individual translator. Only then does literary translation studies come alive and become what it should be before all else a discipline about and for human beings. Thank you very much. Oops. Okay. Yes. Hi. Sorry about that. I have a print from the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your, your talk. So um, I'm not seeing any questions yet in the chat box. We do have a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. So uh, I wonder, are there any questions in this room? Or if anybody would like to add a question, please do start typing in the chat box and I'll get to as many as I can. Are there any questions here? Oh, there we go. Very, someone very quick on the floor. So uh, Susie is asking, how does, all of this fit with your with the recent archival turn. Uh, well, I mean it's a complementary turn. I think if I didn't know even that there is an archival turn, 
another term. Uh, well, I think it's very complementary because the fact that there are more and more archives of translators now, before we had it mostly uh, writers and authors had archives, but now there are uh, web-based uh, archives for translators. Uh, we find them also in classical archives now uh, that they start to stru structure and construct archives for translators. So I think that's, that's, that's also a sign for this turn, if you want to say, that uh, our discipline um, is more and more interested in the persons of the translators. So I think that that's uh, more or less it, um, complements and it uh, validates what I was saying, that there is uh, uh, an interest and uh, also the need to discuss the translator as a person. Yeah? That makes sense to me. Uh, Sarah is asking, um, how can we expand on this notion of autobiographical turn in the digital age? And she's saying, can blogs count as autobiographies? I guess you could... Oh. Could Twitter be? Yeah, of course. I mean, blogs are ah, in in the in autobiography studies. There is a lot of literature on blogs as autobiographical texts. Uh, and what is what is interesting and what also challenges, I think, um, translation or translator studies. Um, many of these web-based autobiographical texts do not only use language. But uh, they use layout, they lose, use pictures, and there is also a kind of ephemerality. So they, they do not stay online forever, especially when you take um, personal sites, they change. So uh, this, there are a lot of methodological questions discussed in autobiography studies, but which are very relevant for us, of course, yeah. And yes, they are autobiographical texts. Thank you. So really, it's uh, it's an enormous potential um, part of the field, then, I guess, if we can include... Oh, yeah. No, no, it's fascinating. Uh, even when you compare personal websites of translators, uh, <laughs> that it's really fascinating how they put up their website, what they put in the website. Uh, and I, to my knowledge, nothing has been done really... Uh, at least at a larger extent, to explore these uh, these autobiographical texts on the web uh, for translation studies. Hmm? Yeah, not not very much for sure. So um, there's another question. The questions are flooding in now, which is wonderful. So uh, how representative can all of this be, or how can we account for the lives of invisible but highly professional literary translators? So. For example, if someone has translated many, many works, but maybe their name doesn't appear anywhere, or they don't have this kind of autobiographical um, material, maybe they'd never even written an introduction, like a translator's preface. How hmm. those into this kind of situation? Good question. I do not really know the answer because, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. Um, I think when um, translators become aware of the fact that uh, uh, they are, they as a person are interesting and important, so maybe uh, more of the translators um, write texts or um, write blogs uh, or make websites. Um, <laughs> But uh, of course, I mean, th that's a problem. We only know of those translators who have a name and who are published. Um, and I think those who have no name, so the infamous men, they are very interesting. But uh, how to find them, and how to get them? Yeah, a good question, but I don't have the answer. <laughs> well, Maybe anybody well of the, the audience has it. Hmm? Oh, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? If someone just said, oh, here's how... Yeah, yeah, I can. I can. <laughs> uh, it kind of leads back into the whole invisibility paradigm. Maybe that's been done enough. Um, so do you see any... Carolina asks, do you see any dangers in doing research on translation, trans, translators' biographies or of translators who are still alive? 
Well, of course, there's always an ethical dimension, I think. No? What, uh, what, what is private, what is public? And of course, yes, I mean, um, yes, there is especially, but as in translation, also in research, there's an ethical part. And I don't know if, if it's a danger, but I think um, what we need is a kind of awareness um, that we do not only deal with texts, but when we deal with human beings, um, we have to be careful. <laughs> yeah. So this might be a danger. Yeah, but uh, this is also a danger in, in writing any biography of anyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. And I suppose it's hard to see all the ramifications before you've actually done the research sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the question is, what do you choose then? You, you have findings and then it's the question, what do you choose for your biography and what is relevant? And uh, that's why it's very important to establish a certain scope. What do you want to show? And I guess it's uh, within a scholarly framework that is, it has to do with the translator and not with uh, any private things that have nothing to do with his translatorial life. Hmm? Yeah, and how do you separate them? Sometimes people... Yeah, sometimes you can't separate them, especially, <laughs> for example, uh, Scott Moncrief, I think his sexuality was a very important part of his translation, uh, the way he translated. So, yeah, but then it's justified, I think. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Giovanna asks, uh, do you also think that a translator-centered approach in translation studies might complement research on translation genetics? I didn't think about it, but yes, I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. But don't ask me if you want to know specifically how. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't answer this. But yes, uh, well, my tentative answer would be yes. <laughs> well, sometimes short answers do <laughs> inspire others. To put in the <laughs> OK, so uh, here's a question from Joseph, who is asking about habitus, Bourdieu's habitus, which mm -hmm. I so he's asking, um, do you think habitus, the idea of habitus, is compre comprehensive enough to cover all the necessary variables you mentioned here? He's thinking about transition, transition turning points, self-image, and so on. Mm, no, I don't think so. I mean, habitus is a great concept and has been in the beginning because it really opened up so many uh, perspectives for translation studies. But in fact, it's not really a concept um, meant for individuals. Uh, and it especially, so, I mean, there's also Lahir with his... Um, with his kind, with his habitus interpretation, which is more focused on individuals, but no, I don't think that habitus is enough. I think we need so many other concepts, and especially um, if we want also, uh, we are not only social individuals; we are also psychological, emotional. So there are so many other aspects that are relevant for uh, biography research or for research into the translator's personality. So habitus is one. And when you focus on certain social aspects, especially of a group, yes, it can be very useful, but certainly not for others. So we need certainly more uh, conceptual work, like identity, self, role, all these concepts. We use them all the time. But very often, we do not really um, ground them in theory, I think. And that's something we have to do in translator studies, certainly, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Kathy asks, um, I think it may be defined as quite a leading question. Do you think it's important to keep a strong sense of subjectivity in mind when assessing autobiographical texts? Because translators often have a retrospective view of their lives that differs to real events. Real, I think maybe should be in um, quotation marks, and biographers are not immune from having a personal preconceived view of their subject either. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, subjectivity, yes, there is. Um, but um, um, for the person who writes his, his um, 
his uh, memoirs or his autobiography. Uh, that is why I said you have really have a close look to when was it written, why was it written, in which context it was written. So all this is part of the research in order to reveal the subjective parts of. Yes, I mean there is, and but I think that's that's not a problem, but that's interesting and also important for us uh, because this illusion in translation studies of objectivity and uh, uh, is not in, in, in harmony with the subject we are dealing with. So subjectivity, yes, but it must be reflected subjectivity, uh, both when we read biographies or autobiography and both when we write uh, a scholarly uh, biographical text, yeah. Sense to me. So, um, okay, I think we've got through the questions that are in the box. So, yeah. can I add, uh, you started out by talking about um, better known translators. Um, so, I was thinking, I wonder whether there is maybe not a risk, but um, by focusing on literary translator studies, is there the possibility that the research will be kind of top heavy and focus on the translators who are really well known or celebrities, whereas maybe people who are less well known might get less attention and then the people who are uh, maybe have done things that are very uh, moving or moving very important for the field but uh, ha haven't necessarily translated a lot might end up being overlooked I guess what do you think yeah uh, um, I guess when when we really start seriously to um, uh, deal with biographies or autobiographical biographical text, of course, first probably we'll focus on what we find. And what we find are the famous translators, more or less. But I think in the course of time, uh, we won't, uh, we, we will find also, we'll, we'll turn to translators in the shadows and who are not so in, uh, interesting. But when we start, certainly, it's, it will not be with the, uh, <laughs> I'm not the invisible ones, but um, I think it's a bit probably similar as in translation studies. First, we only dealt with Shakespeare and Goethe and the big one, and then we turned to uh, mass literature, to audiovisual translation. So I would say it's would it takes time, uh, and the unknown translators won't be the first in line. But I think. <laughs> In the end, we can all, all translators profit from um, such a research angle in the end. Hmm? Makes sense. Uh, I was hoping um, that you might say, oh, it's like this. This is how we do it. But that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, one, one final question before I let you go. Um, why do you think it's taken so long for translation studies to come around to looking specifically at the person of the translator and uh, not focusing exclusively on the text itself? Uh, well, because um, there was a there was a big error or mistake at the beginning of translation studies, because translation studies, well, there were many problems, but the big error was uh, translation studies was not meant uh, to deal with human translation, but first of all with machine translation. So everything was excluded, which is subjectivity, which is not in binary sections. And it took very long also because translation studies was not uh, recognized as a discipline. So when you want to, in academia to get recognized, you have to prove that you are scientific. And scientific always means objective data. So the contrary of what a translator is, a living human being. Um, and that's why it took a long, long time, but you can see this in other disciplines as well, I think. Mm -hmm.
But here we are now, finally. <laughs> That's true. And, and Christina actually correctly um, corrects me there in saying there has been, there has been research in, uh, on, on particular translators in the past, but it's mostly focused on translation history. So yeah. That's fair. That's good. Okay, so thank you very much, Klaus. We have thank you very much. about two minutes before the panels are supposed to kick off. So I don't think it's a bad idea, considering what's happened in the previous one, to give ourselves those two minutes at least. So everyone, you should have your links in your inboxes. If you are struggling to get in for whatever reason, please just wait a little bit because sometimes we're having some technical problems. So Hopefully, I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you very much again, Klaus. <laughs> Thank you very much to you. Bye-bye. <laughs>